This is Phil Koopman with a tutorial on Embedded Software Maintenance. Software maintenance has to do with all the stuff that happens after you think the code is working. Traditionally, it has to do with what happens after you ship the code. Once you ship the code, you need a process to identify bugs and track those bugs to resolution. But it turns out all those bugs aren't necessarily bugs. Many of them are feature requests. So software maintenance usually really has to do with figuring out how to modify and update the software. It's worth noting that in industry, most software projects are not starting with a clean piece of paper. Rather, most software work in industry is taking old code and either updating it to a new version or fixing bugs or more likely both. A key concept for software maintenance is technical debt. Technical debt we'll talk about in more detail but is generally pushing off things to do later and having that come back to bite you. The anti-patterns for software maintenance are that you don't have any formal bug tracking, so your bug tracking is informal. Think of post-it notes. You don't allocate post-release staffing, which means that every time there's a bug after release, it disrupts the work on the next version. And you're not thinking about paying off technical debt on a regular basis. The most obvious activity associated with software maintenance is fixing bugs, so let's start there. When a bug is reported, bug reports don't show up fully formed. Somebody has to notice there's a problem and that bug has to be reported. Once the software is released, those bug reports come in through a support organization. Typically, there's a level 1, level 2, level 3 support organization to capture the bug reports with the level one being the frontline support, which is generally kind of script driven and usually involves users not understanding something about the software or not having read the manual. But it works up through level two specialist to level three, which is typically engineering support. And the idea here is there's a screening and filtering function. So only the things that are likely to be actual real software bugs make it to level three so that they can be fixed. Interpreting the various symptoms and boiling them down to root causes takes a lot of time and there are often duplicate reports, and sometimes those duplicate bug reports end up with different symptoms. So sorting that out is actually a considerable workload. Once a bug has been reported, it has to be prioritized. Not all bugs are born equal. Some are system killers, some are minor inconveniences, and some are things the software is not intended to do and end up really being a feature request. Prioritizing the bug should be done using a combination of frequency and business cost. A good way to do that is to use a risk table. In a risk table, the consequence severity goes by row and the probability goes by column. So you rank the consequence very high to very low and what those bins mean should be consistent but depends on your product. Very high might mean a catastrophic system failure and very low might be a very minor annoyance. And then you take the probabilities and also bin them in a similar way. Very high might be it happens every day to every user very low might be it happens once a year to one user, and so on. Looking at the consequence and the probability, you can look at the intersection and figure out what the severity is. Notice that this risk table is asymmetric. This risk table has weighted consequence more highly than probability. So a very severe bug is going to get either a high or very high risk rating regardless of how often it happens. The importance of using this table is that some teams just rate bugs based on the consequence. Okay, it crashes the system, therefore we have to fix it. But it doesn't necessarily look at the context. For example, if a system only crashes when a maintenance technician is doing a very obscure maintenance operation and the crash is easily recovered by the maintenance technician and takes maybe 10 seconds to deal with, maybe that's not so bad compared to a crash that happens to ordinary users during production operation. On the other hand, you may have a consequence that's moderately low, such as a misspelling, but it may happen all the time and really annoy users. And it could be that that misspelling is a higher risk to the company's success than the crash, depending on the circumstances. And if you don't believe that, think about what if you spelled the company's name wrong on the startup screen compared to a crash that happens to one user every thousand years. As long as it's not a life critical system, it could be that you want to prioritize fixing the company's name above fixing the crash, although probably you do want to fix both. Once you have a bug, you can't just say 
hey, toss it to engineering, fix it. Often, fixing a bug requires someone with particular skills, and that person might have skills that have to do with the technology behind the software application in that area, or it might be the person who worked on the code, or you might have a system that's divided up into many subsystems that are geographically allocated to, to dispersed development teams and so on. Thus, which bugs you fix may have to do as much with resources as it does with assigned risk. A related question is, do you want a quick and dirty fix or do you want a solid re-engineering fix? Usually you want the solid engineering fix, but a lot of times the customers are screaming so loud you go with quick and dirty, and doing so accumulates technical debt, which we'll get to in a minute. After you have the fix, you have to validate the fix. There are two issues with that. First, you have to make sure you actually fix the problem, which surprisingly, some fixes don't actually fix the problem the way you expect. But the other is, you have to make sure you didn't break something else with that fix. And so typically, even for a relatively straightforward bug, you have to run a regression test to make sure you didn't break anything else. Finally, you have to package the fix and deploy it. Is it a hot patch? Is it a complete image? How are you going to get that fix to customers? Is a service call required? Is that fix batched up with other fixes so you can do occasional updates? And so on. Sometimes the pain and cost of deploying a fix for a low-risk bug is such that you batch it up and deploy it in a future scheduled release, hopefully for the current product as an update, but sometimes it's even deferred to the next version that customers have to pay extra for. There's no one right answer for sorting through this, but the point is that all these decisions have to be made as part of the bug management and bug fixing process. While the emphasis on training programmers is usually about taking a clean sheet of paper and creating software from scratch, in fact, in the real world, most software doesn't work that way. Most software ends up taking existing code and modifying it to add features, change purpose, and so on. In other words, most software work is on existing code, not on clean slate. And these days, even if you have a supposed clean slate, you don't write all the code. It's very, very common to take existing components and plug them together, and most of the new code writing is glue between the components. This is especially true using open source components. The notion that most code is maintenance isn't a new one. There's the 60-60 rule from 2001. And the 60-60 rule states that maintenance can average 60% of lifecycle cost. In other words, most of the cost of software happens after you release it, not before. And I've heard other numbers that say it's more like 80%. So clearly, the cost after you release the software dominates the entire cost of the software lifecycle. Furthermore, about 60% of the maintenance is adding new features rather than fixing bugs. Now, if that weren't bad enough, usually maintenance is harder than primary development. And the reason this is, is that you need to understand the existing system. Going into a million lines of code and trying to understand what's going on can be a lot harder than just saying, forget it, I'm just going to start from scratch. But the problem is with a million lines of code, you usually cannot afford to start from scratch. So you have to figure out what's going on with the entire system. If you've had an entire V process that has documentation and that documentation is up to date, then that helps you with maintenance because now you have a starting point. You're not starting from a bunch of code. You actually know what the requirements are. You actually know what the test plan is and so on. Related to this is that optimized code is more painful to maintain. Optimized code is usually harder to understand, but runs faster, but heaven help you if you have to actually change it. The important part of maintenance is the ability to modify a system without breaking things. So you need to understand what the system's doing. You need to understand all the dependencies. Hopefully they're documented so you don't have to figure them out for yourself. And you need to make changes without breaking things. Most programmers eventually get to a place where they look at a big mess of code and say, you know, this is going to be easier to rewrite and throw away than it is going to be to fix. And the problem is that doesn't scale. A related thought is, if the original programmer ended up with a big mess, why do you think you're going to be any different? If you're going to use the same process and the same approach, all you'll end up with is a big pile of spaghetti that you understand, but no one else can. Technical debt is an interesting way of thinking about what happens when you take shortcuts in your design process. Technical debt is messy code, messy designs, messy architecture, or missing things that you just haven't had time to clean up. 
Some signs of debt include degraded code quality, such as spaghetti code or too many globals or a bunch of unresolved compiler warnings. Or maybe some skipped process steps, such as you didn't do peer reviews or you just did them really quickly, or you skipped unit tests. Maybe you're seeing a high fault reinjection ratio. That's when every time you fix something, new bugs appear and it's at a high rate. All those types of things tell you that you're incurring or have already incurred technical debt. In general, the way you incur debt is by taking a shortcut. Now, let's be clear. Short-term debt can be useful. For example, if you have a weekly deadline and your business is going to go out of business if you don't meet the deadline, you may say, I'm going to skip some short-term steps because I have to meet that deadline. Think of it as saying, I haven't got my paycheck yet. I need a new pair of shoes. I'm going to buy shoes on my credit card because without it, I'm barefooted. That can be okay. The catch is what happens after the deadline. Do you pay off the credit card or do you just let the debt ride and move on to other things? The smart way to use technical debt is to incur it when you need to, but repay it as soon as you can by refactoring the system. By refactoring, I mean go back and redesign the system. If you skipped a peer review, go back and do their peer review as soon as you can, not waiting until it's time for the project to ship, and so on. The reason technical debt is a nice analogy is that technical debt incurs interest just like credit cards do. If you take a bunch of shortcuts, you're going to end up with messy code, and that messy code will be harder and more expensive to maintain. It'll be more bug prone, so there'll be more things to fix, and it's more likely to break when you touch it. Over time, accumulated technical debt becomes unsustainable to the point that you end up having to throw away the code and start over. Keeping this in mind, technical debt shouldn't be zero necessarily. It should be used as a tool to have the right amount of debt just like responsible use of a credit card. Technical debt is a reasonable way to smooth out issues with workloads, overloads, and external deadlines, but it should be paid off as quickly as you reasonably can. The best practice is to devote part of each technical cycle to repaying the technical debt. So you may say, all right, if we have to take near-term technical debt, that's what we have to do. Doing so has to be approved, so we don't skip steps willy-nilly, but Management may say, all right, we're going to do this one shortcut, and then we're going to set aside 10 or 15% of our workload to repay that technical debt as soon as we can. The best practices for maintenance start by recognizing that maintenance is going to be what you're spending the majority of your time on if you're a software developer. Most development is maintenance. That means you need to plan for it and staff for it. Often in industry, the part of maintenance that's planned for is the new features. But it's just as important to make sure that staff time is set aside to fix problems with the previous feature to avoid a death spiral that involves spending all the developer's time fixing bugs on the last feature, which makes the current feature late, which piles up technical debt by skipping steps to meet the release, which means that on the release after that, you have even more bugs to fix. You should always set aside time in every development cycle for high-priority bug fixes on previous releases, and if those don't have to happen, have a couple backup features that you slide in, resources permitting. Make sure you keep up with your technical debt payments. Always set aside time in the development cycle to repay technical debt as well as to fix previous bugs. The big pitfalls for software maintenance are mostly not allocating time for bugs, maintenance, and technical debt. Everyone wants to concentrate on new features, but it should not be a surprise when a bug in a previous release needs attention. That's going to happen. You should plan for it. And with set aside time not actually spent fixing bugs, you should be going and finding technical debt to repay so you don't go down into a death spiral. Another maintenance pitfall is evaluating programmers only on their ability to do clean sheet development. That's clearly what's emphasized in colleges and programmer training, but the fact of the matter is, most programmers spend most of their time touching other people's code, and that should be a skill that you really evaluate when you're hiring programmers.